Good evening. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Thank you all for coming out. It's a beautiful evening. Um, this is the second part of our American Creed um, community conversations that we're having. If you didn't have a chance to attend the first one, it is based on the PBS documentary called American Creed, um, in which Condoleezza Rice and um, they go around to different people within the United States and talk about what American Creed is, what it means to be American, to open the tapestry of that throughout the United States. Um, and so we had a conversation two weeks ago to begin with, um, describing what that means to be um, an American. And tonight we are going to focus this conversation on agriculture and farming. And I have two guests with us this evening who will be on the panel who will be fielding questions. Um, we have Tim Elkhorn, who is the director of University well, yes, Scheduling Event Planning. Yeah, event planning. <laughs> Scheduling and event planning at Southwest Minnesota State University. And then we have Ian Weifels, who is an admissions counselor, as well as the program coordinator for events for agricultural, yeah, school of agriculture, yeah. and hospitality management. Yeah. Yeah, advanced so, so thank you all for being here this evening. And we'll um, let it go ahead and start. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thanks to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for helping us. Uh, Cassie Williams was unable to be here. She's off to Portland, Oregon, sorry. <laughs> yes. So we're sad she's okay. not here with us. Um, before we get started, you all have, a, have two post-it notes, and so I'd just like to ask you to write down a quick response to, first of all, um, what do you think of when you think of an American farmer? Um, one post-it, and on the other post-it, um, what is your connection to the land? So if we just do that for a minute or two. seconds here. I'm going to have uh, Tim and Ian introduce themselves and um, how they're connected to the, their farm and what kind of farm it is. And Tim, you were with uh, Marl, so if you could maybe explain what that is as well, that okay. would be helpful. So I'm turning it over to you. Okay, I'm Tim Elkhorn. I'm the, uh, it's, as uh, Michelle said, I'm the scheduling and event planning director at SMSU, but I also farm, and uh, my family's farm is by Walnut Grove, north of Walnut Grove, and uh, approximately 250, a little over 250 acres is what we run. And um, have been there. My dad, my grandpa farmed uh, different land, and then uh, my dad started the farm where we're uh, currently at in uh, 1952. Has uh, built it up over that time. Just within the last year, he moved uh, off the farm to here at Marshall. So uh, it's a corn and soybean operation, and we talked a little bit about how things changed over the years. It's been uh, had livestock, we had uh, hogs and cattle, and, 
uh, also raised uh, alfalfa and oats and wheat and you know different crops. Right now, it's just corn and soybeans, and uh, so it's, it's a, that's the extent of the operation. And I do that in my free time. My wife Bobby is here tonight, so she gives me a hard time about that using up all my free time. So. <laughs> Um, my name is Ian Weifels. I am the Assistant Director for uh, Recruitment and Marketing for the School of Agriculture at SMSU. Um, and my connection to farming is just that uh, it's something I've kind of grown up around. Uh, my dad and uncle uh, farm just outside, uh, kind of northwest of Ghent, um, just outside of Marshall here. Um, and we run roughly a thousand acres, just a little bit under that. Um, and I have just recently started to uh, um, get into the production side myself. I put my first crop in the ground this last year. I did um, just shy of 200 acres and just getting my feet wet, I guess. So I kind of grew up around it, but uh, getting my own taste of it uh, for the first time here, or second time this, this coming year. So. Um, Tim, you mentioned this a little bit about the changes in uh, farming over the industry over the years. So could you expand on that a little bit <coughs> um, from your perspective? It's changed, you know, I'm 52. Tremendously in the time that I've been uh, involved, and so you know, when you grow up on a farm, you're involved from the time you can you know, open the door and go inside. So uh, the the changes, and, and it was kind of fun this afternoon to talk because the uh, students that were there, uh, most of them were you know, urban kids, so I mean, they didn't grow up on a farm. So it was it was. We asked them questions about what they thought, and they had talked about the barns, you know, the big barns that are on farmyards as they're driving uh, to Marshall. And they said, "Well, that's that's indicative of of the change. Is that you know, those barns are kind of a, a symbol of of the uh, farming, but they're not really used all that much anymore as far as livestock production. Because you know, they're different." Different types of, of production that's taken place, and so that you know changes in production techniques and this, just the scope and, and size of operations in that time has has changed tremendously. Because as I was talking about the, I was trying to put things into perspective because we end up in agriculture talking in slang and, and ag terminology all the time, and you know about acres. You know, what what is an acre? How much is the acre? So it's about the size of a football field. And I talked about the, you know, if you drive in the country, you drive, there's intersections every one mile. And in, in the, if you go in that one mile square, that's a, a section of land, which is, is uh, 640 acres. And so you know, we uh, explained that to them. Just the, if you look at those sections, many sections there will be three or four farmsteads or former farmsteads on them that you know, at one time had a family on them. Each of them had a family on them and probably all of them were farming and making a living off of, of that uh, general area uh, by and large. And so now there might be one family living on that. So that, or on that section, and you know, farming the whole section, you know, the, the tillable land. And it, so it's that kind of, of change is the, the biggest <coughs> things that we've seen in, uh, in my life. <coughs> and, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of a natural progression. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I would just kind of build off of that and say, you know, I think what allows us to do that too is just the, the technology that you see now, um, the precision agriculture technology that's available out there. Um, you know, I'm just kind of recently getting into the business side of things. You know, I, I've grown up around it, um, and it's, it's it's something I've seen for a long time. But uh, the cost and everything that comes around uh, some of the technology that, that goes into a, a farming operation now, um, whether you're on the uh, you know, the low end of that, or you're you're completely uh, invested in the latest and greatest. Um, it's expensive either way. To pencil that out and to make it work from a balance sheet and uh, you know, a financial planning point of view is 
is certainly uh, something that's changed drastically, I think. So in relation to that, so you talked about finances for sure, um, what kind of challenges have you faced starting out and having to yeah, uh, for myself, uh, I'm actually involved in the, the farm business management program um, through Minnesota West, um, and they focus on farm uh, family transitions. Um, and so I've, my uncle retired a, a few years ago now, and I've kind of been working in. Um, and for me, it's it's absolutely been essential to uh, have an off farm income uh, because everything I I make related to our, our production agriculture goes right back into uh, sustaining that production and, and buying in uh, to my share of of the business um, and it just uh, for many who are, are trying to get into this industry uh, unfortunately unless they are somewhat grandfathered in um, or have somebody bringing them into the fold it's just almost impossible to get in it's which is sad but it's it's a reality i think that's that's definitely there so. yeah and this is my uh, you, you talked about this being your second year of production this is my tenth you know because i I took over from my dad, and uh, he um, uh, wanted. I mean, he, he's 87, so it's been a while. And he worked a long time, and, and but then he just said he wanted to cut back, and so it was my turn to take over. And instead of me helping him, he started helping me. <laughs> and uh, um, but the the financing end of things is. Uh, it is a uh, tremendous change, you know, and, and that was the thing I illustrated with the students this afternoon. Is, is you look at that section, that section of land, one by one by one, and if it's 640 acres, and if it sells for seven thousand dollars an acre, that's 4.4 million dollars for one section of land, and there's not many farmers that are are making. Uh, a living off one section of land. I know. No. And so it, the, the changes that have come along is, is a lot more investors, uh, people that are just investors that want part of their financial portfolio to be relatively safe and risk free. And land is generally you know, meets that criteria. So it, it's a lot of off the rural community or out of the rural community people that are purchasing land and, and, uh, and then farmers farmers will will buy land that's that has some usually it has some kind of special place in their hearts you know, emotional value yep yeah, it's close close to their farm or you know works for their operation but it's a it's a definitely a intensive operation and, and like Ian said the, the uh, it, you can go crazy that's what you said go to farm farm fest every year you can go break you will go broke uh, all the things that are going to save you money um, <laughs> that are being sold at the you know because there's, there's a lot of things that can make you more efficient but you have to pick and choose uh, what you select or your, it's not going to work yeah. Great. so in, in you talked about um, having that connection with some family member to your uncle give, helping you get going or your father transitioning. So have you seen a dis decrease in farms that have been inherited? And why, why do you see that happening? I, I would say, you know, maybe you see a decrease just because, you know, if, if the average family has, let's say, three kids, um, not all of them are coming back into the operation. Uh, there's, you know, one but, um, son or daughter who is, is interested in getting back in and that just it, it narrows that funnel a little bit uh, which means you know now instead of all the grandkids uh, somewhat being invested in that operation um, there's there's a third of the grandkids uh, that are kind of in that funnel uh, and it just it keeps narrowing that focus uh, so for that reason yeah I think you see a, a smaller amount of inherited land and also just, uh, it's not for everybody, which is okay. Um, it's, it's everybody uh, gets to make a decision at some point about what they want to do, and the reality is it's, it's just not for everybody. Yeah, and that I would agree with that. In, 
in respect to uh, the size of a farm that's necessary for a family to make a living is um, you know it, it, the cost of living continues to go up and probably faster than the, the margin of farming goes up so in order to to make the margin meet the cost of living it's necessary to farm more acres and or raise more livestock more head of livestock and so that's where I think that the, you know that's where some of the decrease comes in in the number of of children that are, are farming is that uh, there has to be the interest. There has to there has to really be a passion for it, or it's not something you casually decide to do. Um, and if there's not that passion, then then the line ends with with the family member that's retiring, and that's kind of the um, how things continue to to grow bigger. I think some of that depends on, uh, you know, I would say the size of the average farm has gotten increasingly bigger, as, as Tim mentioned, over the years. Um, and again, just because it, uh, it takes more acres to feed or to, to support a uh, family. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm maybe not speaking from experience here, but 40 years ago, you probably saw a farm operation that provided an income, but that family also used that land to uh, grow their own if they had their own garden and they were self-sufficient from that point and now I don't I don't think you see as much of that there are certain families who still do that um, but it's it's more about having an income to, to support yourself it, it could take a long time to, to get to that point you talked about that earlier today Tim about it being more um, business focused and you don't have you know your little flock of chickens and your, your garden plot you're concentrating on that hog operation or yeah, it's, it's more focused like, like I, with our farm we, we grow up with cattle hogs and corn and beans and alfalfa and you know, those kinds of things and, and over time it's not that we moved into the, you know, the, the modern confined units or anything like that but it was it's being a master a, a jack of all trades and master of none is is uh, it's, it spreads your risk which is a good thing but it also keeps you from becoming, you know, really good at one thing. And you know, sometimes it's necessary to be really good at that one thing in order to make it work. Uh, but at other times, the flip side is true. If it's that, that's where uh, raising livestock and grain was, was always a, a fallback. Because when the grain, when the grain prices were bad, you feed it to the livestock. The, you know, the livestock prices are, are bad, then you know, we fall back on the you know, revenue from the grain production. So it's a, there's give and take, but it's uh, really, I think, has become more specialized, and probably out of necessity. But on the other hand, there's so many opportunities for uh, people. Uh, you know, I think of Truck guard, truck guard. Uh, you know, as a, it doesn't take a thousand acres. You can have a, a, a farm that's the size of this room. That is would be a lot. And that would be a big operation if you're raising cucumbers to to take to St. Paul Farmers Market or to cabbage or whatever. Uh, so there are opportunities out there. It's just a matter. Of Pursuing them and, and uh, how hard you want to work. So, um, could you expand on that? You were talking earlier about um, in Walnut Grove, some of the mom farmers with their vegetables. Yep. Um, yeah, that, that's where I grew up. Is, is by Walnut Grove, and, and over the last uh, 20, 30 years, there's been a lot of mom uh, um, immigrants that have come and settled in town and. and uh, I know several. I don't know if they're still doing it, but we're we're raising uh, at uh, large for a garden plot. I mean, it would be more of a field of like cucumbers and vegetables and things that really they uh, it was it was uh, common to their diet and culture at home, and so they started raising that, and 
and they were not only selling it locally, but they would truck guard, uh, truck it to, to St. Paul or, or the farmers markets and, and wherever they would get set up. And, and uh, you know, they did very well, but it's extremely hard work, you know, compared to sitting in a tractor and, and uh, having the air conditioner. <laughs> Self-steering self tractor. Self -steering yeah, self-steering yes. tractor, yeah. Yeah, I would just say, you know, I, I think there are, you know, if you're willing to take the initiative, I think there are a lot of ways that you can diversify your farm. Uh, maybe it is that you uh, you have a vegetable garden type farm and you, you hit up your local farmer's market and you make a little money that way. Um, some guys are fortunate enough to, to sit on a, a pile of gravel and they start a gravel pit operation. Um, some of them you know, are, are looking at environmental programs, they'll put their land into CRP because that's ultimately um, not farming the land and, and keeping it in a, a rotation program like that is what will net them more money. Um, it's, it, it truly just depends on, uh, on the individual and what the operation requires. We're seeing, seeing a lot of, of uh, transition to organic mm -hmm. production. Absolutely. And, you know, that, that's, that is, uh, it's more of a labor-intensive type of farming, uh, but it can uh, be very profitable too. In the, you know, the margins on, uh, you know, we're selling soybeans now for eight dollars something, eight fifty. They'll be selling them for eighteen fifty. You know, it's a it's a lot bigger margin, but you don't have you don't have the same set of tools at your disposal for pest control or weed control or you know, those kinds of things. And so it takes a lot more intensive management of the resources to make, make it work. And just uh, on that regard too, you also need to be pretty conscious of, I think, what your neighbor's doing. You know, if I'm trying to run uh, an organic operation, um, I, I need to be in communication with my neighbor even if he doesn't have anything to do with that just because that can affect my bottom line. If I have to take my crop in and get it certified as organic and get it tested and there were chemicals or, or, uh, or grain that got mixed from, from somewhere else uh, that, that can spoil my bottom line pretty quickly. So. Um, speaking of immigrant families, do you have, do you still see a lot of um, immigrants um, as migrant workers coming to the area to do some of those things? That not a lot. You know, at times there's a, uh, Mostly picking rocks is the, the activity that I've seen. Um, I know when there was uh, a lot more, and I would guess as as there are more land is transitioned into organic production, I would anticipate that there will be. You know, as we're looking at uh, if mechanical tillage can't take care of the weed control, you know it's necessary to walk the beans or or yep. So those kinds of things and and. Uh, of course, in, uh, it's not migrant, but the, the labor pool for the uh, meat processing facilities is, is primarily immigrant uh, labor. So whether it's Worthington or Montevideo or Wilmer, you know, those, those locations are here in Marshall. Lots of, lots of immigrant labor that is uh, uh, making those plants work and like it said this afternoon, every mile that you have to truck a turkey or a hog, you know, every mile that they have to have wheels under them is a cost, it's an expense. So I see the, the presence of those facilities as, as being a benefit to us because if, if turkey producers in the area had to, had to send Instead of coming to Marshall, they had to send their things to Postville, Iowa. That's a different story as far as your cost of production goes. So it's, it's definitely an advantage to those producers that are, are able to utilize those markets. I would agree. And uh, just to kind of touch back on your question a little bit, uh, you know, I think especially over the last several years um, with uh, economic standings being where they are, you see guys really weighing. Um, what their expenses are. Um, and if that means I gotta spend an extra five hours this week picking rock myself because I'm not gonna pay myself for that, um, 
that's a that's a realization that I need to come to and, and make that decision for my operation. Somebody down the road might have a little more capital at their expense, and they can afford to bring in some help um, wherever that source might be coming from. But uh, I do think, you know, like Tim said, you, you've seen a little less of that uh, lately um, because families and operations are really watching their bottom line because its margins are very tight right now. Talk more about that. What, is, what are the what are the causes of some of the tightening of the um, just, uh, you know, for, from our standpoint, uh, you know, Tim and I are both uh, grain farmers. I, you know, our family is just doing corn and soybeans. Uh, we don't have any cattle. We, we don't have that uh, um, diversica uh, diversification of uh, a revenue stream. So um, I'm strictly reliant on uh, what the cost of, uh, or what the price for a, a bushel of corn and a bushel of beans is. Um, and right now, they're not great. Um, there's, uh, there's just, it's, it's very, very tight. Um, you, you definitely need to be aware ahead of time um, you know, where my selling points are at. I need to, to plan out a balance sheet and I need to know before I even put my crop in the ground um, what my expenses are going to be, uh, what my what my costs are going to be, what my, my income is going to be, and I need to know that at $3.40 uh, that's my break-even point. And, you know, if that means uh, the market might not get above Three dollars and fifty cents this year, and I'm only going to come out a couple thousand dollars ahead. Better a couple thousand dollars ahead than uh, a couple thousand dollars or, or more behind. So, um, one of the things we always know of the history of, of farming, and we have this image of helping one another, the barn raising, the you know somebody's sick and you go out and help them get their crop in. So. Now we've got major flooding in Nebraska and Iowa. So talk about um, what farmers go through when they have to deal with some of these extra stressors that are always there because nature does what it will. You know, it is probably one of the, I'm sure, I think, for the grace of God, go I, I have, but it hasn't happened to, in my family. It's one of the hardest times for a family to go through when that happens, but it's also one of the best times for a community and uh, those neighbors and those that are are wanting to help to come together to help somebody that is in that situation because of an illness or an accident or uh, something like that, that they need uh, assistance. And, uh, you know, and from an economic standpoint, too, I think there's there's more of that kind of place, especially in younger farmers. Um, not so much in the, from an emergency standpoint or, or a disaster standpoint of share, you know, of purchasing equipment together, working together with somebody because uh, uh, you know, because the the cost of equipment is so high um, for new equipment that there will be uh, farmers that work on ways to cooperate with one another for um, sharing equipment. And it's to their benefit uh, to make that work. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think you see a lot of families or um, operations that go in together. Um, they will, you know, maybe it makes sense for me to purchase uh, the harvest equipment, the combine, and it makes sense for Tim's operation to have the, the tillage equipment and for another family to have the, um, the planting equipment. and. You know, between us, we're all farming 1,500 or 2,000 acres. Um, what a great way for us to, to decrease our, our expense, to increase our bottom line, and to uh, you know be able to help each other out um, from uh, not only a cost standpoint but from a labor standpoint. Um, yeah, it's probably possible to farm by yourself, but it's it's a heck of a lot easier to do it with uh, somebody else or a couple people helping you, especially in the fall. Okay, so. Now uh, I want to lead us back into the American Creed part of our, our discussion, and so my question is, how do ties to the land affect your perception of being an American? You know, I, I guess I would just take it back to the beginning. Um, I, you know, I think as, as America was settled and homesteaded, um, that's what it was about. It was about having a new opportunity um, to kind of set down your roots and um, you know, work off the land and uh, you know, 
earn yourself a living that you might not have had a chance at uh, somewhere else. And I think that's still true, maybe not to the, uh, the extreme that it was uh, 100 or uh, more years ago, but um, it gives me a great sense of pride, I know that, uh, to say that I, I still work the land. Um, I, I produce uh, for, for a much larger portion of the population than, than just my own family. Uh, I'm working to, um, you know, feed the world sounds a little uh, a little uh, entitled, but uh, to some extent, yes. So. And, uh, that's very true. And I, uh, you know, when you think about it, that it's the opportunity for all of the other things that that make America what it is, whether it's uh, arts or the industry or the, uh, things that are, you know, whatever are people's passion. People's ability to pursue their passion becomes a lot easier if they're not growing their own food. If you have to take, you know, half or more than half of your working year to feed your family, you're not free to write books. You're not free to uh, to learn to play an instrument. You're not free to pursue the development of another type of business or those kinds of things. So the, the ability, you know, when they talk about the, the industrial revolution of America, uh, it, was, it went hand in hand with agriculture becoming more efficient and, and as those Ability for people to have a dependable source of food outside their own garden, uh, whatever that uh, it made it uh, freed them up to do other things. And you know, think about wartime and the pride that people have in what they do. And it, it was like Rosie the Riveter was building airplanes and tanks and, and ships and thing that made it possible for for her to be doing that was the fact that she didn't have to be canning food. You know, she could be working and somebody else could you know, produce the food efficiently enough that it was affordable for her to take the wages that she got from her living and purchase it and still have money left over to, to buy other things to make her living. So it's a, it, it really has allowed America to what it is by freeing people up to do what they do. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'd like to open up for questions. If anybody has any questions or comments. Um, when I hear the term factory farm, I kind of get a picture in my head. I'm curious about what you guys think of when you hear the term factory farm. I think that there's There's a necessity for, you know, we have 350 million people in America, and 300 million of them eat pork. The number of farms that we have raising hogs is, has to be significant. There has to be a, a large number. And, uh, and with the way the market has developed, there's not the ability to uh, to raise them a dozen at a time. So that's a scale. And the term factory farming comes from the, the scale. And uh, it, it appears to be mechanized. But in reality, I, I, I bristle at the term a little bit just for the fact that, you know, the, the, yeah, there are, there are in other states, right? in Minnesota, more of a, of a corporate uh, type of structure where, but their barns are the same as, as our barns. Whether you know, it's the difference is in who's up to the ownership. Uh, and so uh, the ability and, and the political, uh, the political uh, target that those uh, or corporate entities have on their back is 
has to be transferred to my chest because the thing, you know, the, 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 the way that they're attacked for their style of production is the exact same style of production that I'm using. And so it's people that can't make the differentiation between that political part of the equation and the production side will only see the production side. And so they'll see me doing the same thing that they're doing. Therefore, I need to be shot at too. And so I don't, I don't see the term. Um, I don't, I don't uh, like the term. And, and as I told the kids this afternoon, that as and I hope that, that as their urban kids going to school in a rural area, they probably are sitting in classes with um, kids that grew up on farms. And I hope that as those those types of discussions take place that they take advantage of talking to their classmates about to see what's what is it really like to live on a hog farm you know and and i told them i said there's bad people in every profession there's bad librarians there's bad librarians there's bad teachers there's bad Policemen, there's bad farmers, but you know that doesn't make the whole. You know, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. On the other hand, uh, you have a system like Christensen Farms, and this is an absolute true statement that he made the statement that we just want to make one dollar a hog, and it's vertical integration. You know, they sell to the packer and they have a tie to the packer and a smaller hog operation has a hard time finding a market for their hogs. And Christensen Farms makes, is satisfied with one dollar a pig. On a million pigs, that's a million dollars. And that was a state, it was in one of the papers, ag papers about 20 years ago. And so <clears throat> when you have an operation like that, it drives down the opportunity for a smaller operator to make any money. And it's through vertical integration. Just like they did in North Carolina, they have polluted all their water with hog manure and they can't get rid of it. The same thing is happening in dairy. We have a surplus of milk and we have a surplus of cheese. And we're driving out the smaller producers. Anybody that milks 50 to 250 cows is losing money and they're going out of business. And yet South Dakota plans to add 85 thousand cows to their herd over there to prove that they're dairy friendly. And yet it's the smaller producer that gets blamed and gets pushed out and is dumped out of the, out of the market to make a living. And you know I grew up I grew up on a quarter section. We milked cows, we raised our calves, we had chickens oats and hay and corn and when I was 19 years old I stacked first cutting of hay for nine farmers. Nine farmers. First cutting. Those farmers don't exist anymore. I bet you have a hard time finding three farmers in Lincoln County that put up hay. You know the landscape has totally changed. When I was selling farm machinery, the first years that I was selling farm machinery, we sold a lot of parts. I sold tons of plowshares. I sold tons of cultivator shovels. And the year that we plowed down the corn, uh, was that 85 or 87, somewhere in there, the corn didn't get ripe, and so the government had a program, and they plowed down all the corn. That was the last year that I sold cultivator shovels. After that, it went no-till. Right. And it, you know, right. the whole farmscape has changed. We went from the moldboard plow, we went to the chisel plow. Uh, I was working and selling for a company out of Nebraska and they were chewing me out for not selling cultivators. And I said, the farmers today, their cultivator is 60 feet wide. Well, nobody makes a cultivator that big. 
I said, it's called a sprayer. You know, with the advent of chemicals, we went from the mechanical cultivation of the land to the chemical cultivation of the land. And uh, the more chemicals came in, the bigger the sprayers got. I was exhibiting at uh, Big Iron in Fargo, and I had a 120-foot sprayer there. And when you're sitting on the tractor looking at 120 feet, that's a lot to watch. And this one guy was kind of being a smart butt with me. <laughs> he says, that's not big enough for me. He says, I need a 200 foot sprayer. You know, and, and it all boils back to, you know, we have less people on the land, we have less available workforce, unless you have family members that it's hard to trust them on a $250,000 tractor. Just turn a kid loose on a quarter of a million dollar tractor, you aren't going to do it. So we're losing, losing our workforce. We've lost our animal husbandry, I say, because my dad was like a veterinarian with his cows. And, you know, he cried if a cow calf died. You know. uh, so we've lost that connection, and we're becoming more commercial. We're becoming, becoming more factory oriented. And yeah, we can say that it uh, that we need it to feed the world. But I have a friend who works with pig genetics. He's been a veterinarian with a hog company out of Rochester, Minnesota. He says, in reality, we have about the same number of hogs we have, we've always had. They're just in confinements. Instead of being on every quarter of land, have somebody having 40 hogs, they're confined. And so, I mean, agriculture has really changed. It'll never go back to what it was. Um, but, you know, I work with a group called Land Stewardship Project, and we try to promote sustainable agriculture. We work with transitions. We have a, a beginning farmer program that a person can come take the classes and apply for a loan, and the state of Minnesota has a program that helps beginning farmers get into access to land. And we were just lobbying for that at the legislature here a week ago, you know, asking for, for money for that. Uh, Forever Green, cover crops. Uh, we need our university to be working to develop not only uh, additional crops to corn and soybeans so that a farmer can make a living planting something besides corn and soybeans, but we need them to figure out how we can get uh, a cover crop on the land either before the harvest or or something that germinates. And it's hard to get something to germinate in October. I mean, it, that's the reality of Minnesota. But our University of Minnesota, a land-grant college, needs to be working on those kinds of things to help guys that are on the land keep the land green so when the snow comes, it doesn't blow away. You know, you see the guys that raise soy, uh, sugar beets. Their land is absolutely flat. And it's black. And in the spring, the ditches are full of dirt. Yeah, so, yes. Well, just to, as a small counterpoint, you're right, it's probably not going to ever 100% go back to where it was. But interestingly to me, there are farmers markets in the country that are failing not because there's too much produce and not enough people, but there's way too many people who want it and not enough people growing bring, you know, food, truck farming, to bring it to the farmer's market. So, you know, I think that there are these niches like organic farming, truck farming on smaller land, growing different things so it does help keep the, the land rich and things like that. Um, talk a little bit about, do you see that trend continuing? That there will be more of that farm to table or, you know, kind of cutting out the, or having to have my food come from another continent? You know, I feel like in some ways, especially for our general production, I lived on the West Coast for a while, almost all of our meat came from Argentina, Canada, and New Zealand and Australia. Even though it was closer, I, it would have been closer for me to get it from Minnesota, <laughs> but that's not, it's like they won't go over the mountains, so, you know what I mean? So talk a little bit about lessening, or the possibility of lessening um, the distance that our food has to travel. Well, I, 
I know that there are already programs in place that are identity preserved. So I mean, if you go in and get pork chops, if you have, uh, you know, if it comes from the right um, farm or, or the right uh, processor, you can take a, your your cell phone and scan the mm -hmm. code and see the the farm that it came from. Right. See a profile of the people that raised it. So I, you know, identity preserved through the. In some ways, it's a marketing scheme, but in other ways, it's a food safety food yeah, safety. Absolutely. And so, you know, there you can look at it as as a, a detriment, or you can look at it as an opportunity. Those that are you know, promoting themselves and their farm and their way of production, and uh, you know, can package and sell the story. Me and my family are raising these hogs uh, that you're enjoying the pork or sausage or you know whatever you're uh, having from them is is an opportunity and that gets you to a, a chance and not everybody can do that but but it's it's an opportunity where you don't have to raise a million to make a million you know you can you know because you can build that premium of your of your story into into the product, so I think there is definitely that. And then the other biggest challenge, and it's, it's something that uh, any businesses in the area that are are thriving and doing well have a help wanted sign in front window, and th those are all labor intensive activities. And so it's a, it's a matter of figuring out. Uh, Farmers have to be often as skilled at people management as they do at soil management and uh, product management, just for the fact that it takes a labor force to, to get some of those kind of, of intensive things done. Yeah, I would 100% agree. Um, not that, uh, you know, you kind of hinted at it earlier, not that a farmer hasn't always had to, to be somewhat of a jack of all trades. He needs to be the, you know, the businessman, he needs to be the welder, he needs to be the mechanic, he needs to, you know, to find a, a way to diversify himself to, to reduce his bottom line. Um, or increase the bottom line. Or increase the bottom line, excuse me, thank you. A little tongue tied here. Um, but from an, you know, an organic standpoint, um, you know, that, that's, I think that hits home, or very close to home for a lot of American families. They, they want to know where their food comes from. They want to know it's safe. They want to know it's, they're supporting local community members, but it, it could be hard to go to the, the grocery store and look at a pound of organic hamburger that's six, seven, eight dollars a pound, or the non-organic one that's three or four dollars a pound. It's just it's not necessarily a feasible option for everybody who's out there. I think there are certainly markets for it, and there's you know, certainly a niche for that, but it's it can be tough to find them sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, you know, uh, I think. Uh, uh, Part of it too is that um, well, demand has has you know partially driven um, some of these these trends going to organic and, and sustainable farming and things like that. Um, but uh, also the farmer themselves. I mean, you know, we talked a little bit about you know confinement barns and you know they, the the term factory farm. Uh, some of these things um, it it does a farmer no good. To raise a sick animal, or to abuse an animal, or to you know, I mean, so the the farmer, you know, and have farmers always done a great job? Uh, you know, it's had they they've had their ups and downs. They had to learn. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't always out of uh, uh, negligence more so than it was out of. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but ignorance, not knowing. You know, and then learning. Okay, well, what's a better practice here? And uh, you know, so it, it's in the it's in the farmer's best interest to try and raise healthy and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, good animals and to, you know, take proper care of them. It only helps their bottom line. It's just like in the uh, slaughterhouse, you know, it, it uh, you know, it, it doesn't do a, a slaughterhouse operation any good if their employees are all back abusing the animals and bruising them and things like that when they're taking them off the trucks. And so I think that the farmers have, have uh, they're doing a better job 
you know, and, and part of it is driven by the consumer too, saying, hey, you know, we're taking a little closer look at things here. And so, um, you know, and farmers have found that, you know, maybe maybe having a, just a small amount more room can help their bottom line or, you know, help so that their animals, they don't have to have that risk factor of, um, you know, animals becoming sick. Uh, you know, I mean, we had that avian influenza outbreak, having too many animals, you know, close together. Uh, even farms that were close together, it ended up hurting them uh, pretty bad. Um, so I, I think that's a big part of it too. And uh, I just wanted to kind of go back earlier too, because we were talking about how the family farms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and and you know, it's true that it's not. Uh, there's a niche for smaller, sustainable type farms, um, but it is a niche market. You know, most people are like you said, they're not. You're gonna buy a pound of beef for three, four dollars, or eight dollars. It makes a big difference. But um, the uh, and your your factory factories, your meat factories, uh, are going the same way. I mean, I've I've been in uh, the industry for almost 30 years, 28 years. I started out uh, in Marshall at the Turkey uh, Heartland Food Company, it was called, and now I'm a USDA food inspector. Um, but I remember back when uh, when I first started working for industry um, and uh, you know friends and stuff that had worked for industry. It used to be primarily there was a there was always a uh, uh, immigrant presence, you know, but it was a small. It was maybe ten percent of your workforce. A lot of your workforce was made up of you know actually a lot of them were uh, um, old, uh, older farm wives who uh, would go in and they would you know work and then they would help out at the farm and do what they needed to do. Um, but uh, slowly, as those people started to as those farms started to become bigger, that labor pool went away. There was no longer those, because you know, mostly it was farm, farm wives, farm kids that were willing to do that kind of work. Well, when, when those people started going to college or not, you know, whatever, those kids no longer were in the, were no longer in the business or those, you know, those, el those older farm wives were then retired, there were the, the labor pool changed. Uh, it became more uh, of a minority labor pool. Um, but at the same time, uh, these uh, producers have become much more automated as well. Um, some of these places were used to be about 20% automated and about 80% of it was all manually manual labor. And that has switched around completely. Uh, a lot of these places now are 80% automated automated and it's only getting to be more so so uh, you know in some um, mostly the bigger ones you know you still have some smaller some smaller ones that uh, that haven't done that but uh, you know that industry is changing as well too Anita. I'm gonna bring the conversation back a little bit around to our farming and its ties to being an American so Thomas Jefferson had the idea that the ideal America was a nation of yeoman farmers. That the best America would be if we were a nation all of small family farmers. And that's one of the reasons why he made the Louisiana Purchase. Because we were going to need the land for all these Americans to become yeoman farmers. And I think this ideal has survived at least somewhat into the present. So do you think that farmers in general, even now, think of themselves as the truest Americans, the most American of Americans, because they have land <laughs> and they're farmers. And the second part is, do you see yourselves as the truest Americans because you are farmers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, that's for me looking at agriculture as somebody who's been around it my whole life. Uh, somebody who's grown up in a different industry, uh, maybe from an entrepreneurial standpoint, or or whatever their family business might be, probably also feels the same, because that's their American dream and their American opportunity. So it's very easy for me to sit here and say, yeah, I'm the truest American out there because I work the <laughs> land and uh, I'm a farmer. And uh, yeah, I do, I do take pride in that, but I don't think I can take that away from somebody else who also feels the same in, in a different industry. I, I agree, and I think that um, the you know, the, the, 
things that I've talked about before and how it has, um, how agriculture and the development of production agriculture has uh, allowed the country to develop. You know, it's, it's just freed up those human resources to pursue other things that have, you know, if, if Bill Gates had to spend half of his 20s raising carrots and beans and sweet corn, you know, what, what would America look like? Or any, any entrepreneur um, in, in the country that has, you know, had the ability to dedicate their time and energy and thought process to, to their work um, is, is largely able to do that, you know, because they're, they're freed up. I, I do really, there is a connection, I mean, that we talked about that this afternoon, that is, it, it is a, a lifestyle, whereas, and a, and a vocation, and it's a, something that you have to have a passion for in order to stay interested, because it's not always extremely profitable. Um, right now, it's not, and, uh, but I'm certainly looking forward to spring tillage and planting and you know that kind of thing to see see the process start all over again because that gets in your in your heart and in your head and and it's uh, you know it, if if things go good you know things will work out in the end sometimes they don't you know we had a terrible year last year we had the the, the farm where I farm had the rain event. And on the 3rd of July, where it rained nine and a half inches, all in one thing. And, uh, you know, it drowned out 25% of the crop. And so the rest was really good. But, but you go through a, a field with and, and hit a section 25% of the field where the yield monitor says zero. Um, that brings the average down really, really fast <laughs> for the rest of the acres. Um, and but there's still pride in in the the work, and uh, I think that's that's something that keeps you going. Kind of hit back on that too. I you know, it's almost a double-edged sword <laughs> because the success of American farmers has allowed less people to be farmers. Exactly. The more successful you are, the yep. fewer people can be part of this ideal. Yeah. Right. Not, yeah. Not, <laughs> maybe not necessarily yeah. less people can be part of it, but less people ultimately need to be part of it, right. which allows for other opportunities, which, depending on who you're talking to, I guess, is, is a good thing or a bad thing. Kevin, yeah. you had something? I just got a message from my renter at a restaurant that the copper pipe is leaking. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say a couple things. First of all, uh, I was going to bring up the Jeffersonian ideal as being fundamental to the idea of being American, but the only way that was possible was uh, if we um, got rid of the Native Americans. Right, right. So, you know, the true Americans are the Native Americans, and they're still here. So, they live right up the road from all over. It's very interesting getting to know them and having them talk about it. Um, the second thing is, I, I kind of take exception to what you're saying about how it frees up people to be like Bill Gates. Because as a historian of this area, it seems to me that the, the livelihood of a farmer and farm families, uh, you have to be a generalist, you have to be an inventor, and you have to be hands-on, and you're outside, and you're working together, that that's actually the perfect uh, petri dish for entrepreneurship and innovation to uh, to flow. So the inventor of the farm all system, you know, grew up in Dawson and Montevideo and created all these power takeoffs and all this whole system. Uh, the really? You grew up in Dawson? Yeah. Rollmatic. Hmm. Yeah. And I then, know uh, you know, the, 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 round, the round horse family and, and Trojan seeds and, and how that changed all of agriculture over in Olivia. You know, again, just farmers who experimenting with with uh, growing corn and genetics and 
it you know turned out there's 12 companies moving there and it changed everything. It's something like a, a huge percentage of all the corn planted today has roots in Olivia, Minnesota. I mean, so it's it's uh, time after time that the farmers I have come to know are so ingenious, persistent, resilient um, people, and that is to me your element of the culture. And what I see happening is, uh, and this is what I wanted to ask you, because you started off today by saying, um, you know, it is what it is, you know. And I felt like I felt like you guys are saying, hey, it's just the way it is, you know. Things get bigger, and, and, and so I look at it and go, yeah, it's like that Monopoly game where you start off and somebody's going to end up with all of the property. And, um, and, and, and so is there a way to have an agrarian society where that doesn't happen? It has there ever been in history, is my question. Um, because it really seems like we're in a situation where fewer and fewer own uh, more and more, and it's we're and then technology and robotics, you know, they're saying <laughs> you're not going to need a farmer to plant corn and beans anymore. It'll be a robot planting corn and beans, right? That, that's what I'm reading. Um, and to add to that too, on the other end of things, uh, like I said, I. I uh, worked at Turkey Valley, or actually it was, it was Heartland Foods back then, and they had a magazine, Turkey World, and it came out and it would list the, 100, the 100 top turkey companies in the United States, okay? They couldn't do that today. Yeah. There are Jenny about Oak, 17 turkey here. companies now that produce all of the turkey in the United States. There are, so so that, that list no longer uh, is, is even applicable. Right, consolidation. So I, I, the best line I ever heard of an of a essay is by Wendy Berry, and it's, what are people for? What are we here for? And it used to be, we were here to raise food and take care of each other. Now, we're going to create a society where everybody gets a cell phone and grows up in an urban area and eats uh, soil and green, and doesn't see um, you know, where food comes from, and they have nothing to do. This is what's, what they say is the coming group. People are going to have nothing to do. Farmer wouldn't say that right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it seems like that now, but this is what, this, what the futurists are saying. Well, and I, and I think some of the things that you're talking about is um, that, that calling or that um, yearning for, for that connection is still there. I mean it's still it's still there. You you look at the number of of and it's funny but uh, urban urban uh, poultry old urban poultry production where they'll have a you know a little coop and a little pen for for chickens and you know they raise their own eggs, they raise you know the when the chickens get done laying then they've got chickens. Um, and but they're that kind of thing Making a living at it, I, you know, I don't know economically. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that being a, a you know, an agrarian society where where we where we have that opportunity. People will have the opportunity to to have the connection and and do it as you know, well, basically as I'm doing is it is a hobby. You know, it's not my living. I don't make my living doing this, but I'm doing it. But it's a larger scale than than a lot of people's hobbies, and it's more expensive than a lot of people's hobbies. But it's it's a, an opportunity to have that connection, or it's or it's people that are are doing um, pumpkin patches, or you know those kinds of things that that have a you know, we're putting a seed in the ground and we're we're growing something and we're having that connection to growing and, and producing things, but it's not necessarily the way that we're all making our living. Um, and, and so I, 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 don't, I don't know that there, there is a way to return to that, but at the same time, if you know, the law of the jungle only lasts for so long. You know, in, in any concentration, 
there becomes a point of, of crash. You know, when the deer this time of year are all herded up and there's 200 deer in a herd and one of them gets sick, they all get sick and they all die. You know, the Bonanza farms up in the Red River Valley, you know, you had, you know, tens of thousands of acres run by single operators and they don't exist anymore. You know, we're moving back you know, it's cyclical, it moves back to that stage, but they don't, they, they, that model failed. And there's, you know, the Brazilian model where they've got 20,000 acres. And, you know, they, they, can, they can do it. I've been on a farm in South Africa with, you know, they had tractors lined up called Round the Block for, you know, and they were farming uh, thousands of acres. Um, but it was, it was, you know, they all have their place. They all have a, uh, their benefits and drawbacks, and, and I think in, in there reaches a point where they can't can't manage. And, and we've seen that just in recent years. This year, with a, there was a, a farmer that that reached that scale, that went down and took down companies with them. You know, because it's it, you. You roll the dice uh, with the same person, and you put too much money down on the table. Everybody's going down. So it, 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 it's not gonna. There's gonna reach a point where that growth isn't possible. Go put all your eggs in one basket, right? <laughs> yeah. This, I just want to give a shout out in case you guys don't know, but just a mile and a half from here, that uh, Lyon County Family Farm of the Year, Deutz. Dykes Heritage Farm. I mean, you walk on there and you feel like you're in the 1950s. They got the the pigs and the and the, and the chickens, and uh, they are trying to raise food to sell to the people of Marshall. And you know, he, I talked to him. He goes, "Well, I said, well, local Montevideo is local." He goes, "No, not my book. You know, I should be able to sell all of my food that I'm raising a mile and a half from the edge of town here." to these people here. But he can't. People won't buy him. They're trying valiantly, but they're not, I mean, it's, they have to have other jobs to support their farming habit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's sad. I think the discussion's got a little, I know, how far afield, no pun. You know, we need to bring it back to um, Thomas Jefferson, I think. So I, I have a Thomas Jefferson question, a related question. Um, with the concept of some of those things that were said about Jefferson. I have a question that I'd like you to think about putting it in the perspective of that time and many years after Thomas Jefferson, where in an agricultural system, you would have many, many farmers in the United States get incredibly wealthy due to slave labor on their farms. So I would hope that we could look back at history and kind of acknowledge that that was something that wasn't a good part of our farming heritage, but it was. It, it was just a true thing, obviously. So if we look back and see that, my question would be to the modern day, what would be something that we might look at in the not so distant future and look back from the perspective, even though you said you bristle at the term of factory farms or big corporate farms, what is something that you could see that we might at least be open to acknowledging is maybe an issue that we should take on and not pretend that there's not negative pieces to that, if that makes sense. And I know that's a big jump from slavery to maybe some things going on today, but still with that vein of that concept of morally what's right and wrong for the big picture of the nation, if that makes sense. Can you think of any things today going on in those trends in, in factory farming that we might look back to regret? Um, yeah, and it's obviously hard to say because you don't know what's going to happen in the future, but the buzzwords that come to mind would you know, depending on, you know, there's two sides to every coin, but GMO, Monsanto, um, you know, some of those kinds of things. I mean, depending on how you feel about that, I mean, Monsanto as a company is massive. I mean, yeah. They've got their fingers in, in everything. It's true. Um, you know, I can't sit here and necessarily bash them because I use Roundup Ready corn and I use Roundup Ready beans and I, I use those chemicals and that's, that's part of what helps uh, me be successful. But yeah, it could be very easy to say 20 or 30 years from now that that was a huge mistake. Uh, we did some stuff that was 
um, unreversible, and, and now what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there is, and you know, it, the the production practice that comes to mind is the the uh, uh, trendy move towards cage-free eggs. You know, in poultry, we don't have a lot of in right in this general area a lot of laying facilities, laying egg facilities. But you know, that is <clears throat> is one where I just I even as a farmer have a hard time seeing the, those birds in a, a little tiny cage like that and not thinking, you know, is that the right thing to do? But at the same time. Eggs are a source of protein, an affordable source of protein for millions of people in, in the world. And so if, if your decision making process is that you know, we're going to do away with this and, and make it less efficient to produce billions of eggs in a year, and we eliminate that source of protein for people as an affordable choice, who who do you want not to get their protein? Well, I, I would ask I mean, those, that's a, yeah, and I, I get those points, but who would say that it would necessarily have to be eliminated versus possibility of maybe an unfair playing field with the power of the big corporate farms to maybe make it harder for someone like the programs that Al was bringing up for somebody that's trying to get into maybe one of those niche markets, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So something along that that line of some kind of compromise to where there's you know ability for both to exist that mm -hmm. it's valid point that you, you, if you you know I don't think there's any large cry for you know you know outlying things like that necessarily because that's just a reality that you wouldn't be able to feed the world in the near future if you made drastic changes like that but they they have in California yeah they have no I mean it's a it's a cage free state and so you know, things are a little more expensive, though. Yeah, and then and that's that's the reality of the situation, and and people that are limited on, on a limited budget, they have they can stretch their food dollar only so far, and so they'll you know if they if eggs was their source of protein, you know they might switch. They will, if if they can't afford eggs anymore, they're either going to go without protein. Or they're going to find something else, you know, whether it's beans or you know something else. But it's sometimes not an option to trade. So it's it's a, it's a challenge to to do the right thing, but also you know you've got people that are depending upon you, and, and you know to to do the to provide the food they need. Um, I think the I want to say it was. From the 1950s, I believe, uh, that 25% of the American, of the average American's income went towards food. And uh, the study, it's a little bit, it's a little bit past dated now, but not too much. But the last study that I remember reading about it was about 10%. So, so people went from spending 25% of their disposable income on food to spending 10%, which is a huge. Uh, you know, if you consider that somebody makes, you know, $50,000 a year, uh, you know, they went from spending uh, about, uh, would be about uh, $12,500 to only spending about $5,000. So. Mm -hmm. We spend less percentage of our income than any other country, mm -hmm. so I understand. Mm -hmm. Americans. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the variety that we have at our disposal, I mean, is unbelievable. And then how much is actually wasted, thrown away before it's ever 20%. Mm -hmm. And then how much corn is grown is actually used for animal feed or for energy. I think it's like 45%. Mm -hmm. I know 45% is used for ethanol. Yeah. So and I know... Yeah, but that's still animal feed too. I have ethanol. a question about kind of on ethanol. And I know that you guys, I'm sure, are, are fans of ethanol. But, uh, which is great. I mean, I think, you know, if we can, it's a renewable source of energy. But uh, what are your guys' thoughts on, um, 
the government subsidizing uh, ethanol. It has been doing it for a long time. You can go and buy, get ethanol for, you know, uh, about 50%, 50 cents cheaper than, you know, any other, uh, you know, than, than petrol, gasoline. Um, you know, is it time for the government to start backing off on, on some of those uh, subsidized programs if, you know, I mean, because, I mean, let's, I mean, like I said, it's, it's good, but if, a, if an industry can't, if an industry can't make it without a subsidy, then is it, is it worth continuing to pursue it? If it has to be subsidized, you know, is it worth, is it worth pursuing? Because when you, when you talk about green energy, uh, when you look at it after, you know, how much water is used, how much energy is used in harvesting and, and you know, processing and, and trucking and all this other stuff, is it, is it you know, what is the, what is the, the difference in the carbon footprint between, between oil and ethanol? Is it worth continuing to push those programs? From my, I mean, I, I'm not an ethanol expert, but from my understanding, it's not a production subsidy, it's a subsidy for access to uh, the distribution site, distribution system. Get to the consumer. Yes. Because there's, you know, it, it's not that there, people are being paid to produce ethanol. Right. They're, they're paying. They're paying them to mix it. That's what they're doing. Yeah. To yeah, make I, sure that, yep. Yeah. But is it worth continuing to do? We still subsidize oil. Well, the petroleum industry. Is, yeah, that's very and true. How, how long does that have to go on? Yeah, I'd rather, I'd be honest, I'd Which rather, I'd rather see the ethanol <laughs> subsidized than the oil. I mean, that's yeah. you know, that's Monsanto true. just sell, uh, settled a lawsuit with Nebraska, and I believe the figure was $2.5 billion. On that roundup? Just settled today. Was it that roundup? Oh, yeah, roundup. Round yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's. You talk about things that that potentially could, you know, come back and say, because we've all been told forever that Roundup is the the uh, you know least harmful possible pesticide that you could use, and you know that it's. Uh, but if if in 20 years we find out that the percentage of people with MS is higher here because of the amount that's been used. And I'm not saying that's the case, but if, say, it's, it's autism or MS or whatever, heart disease, is, and they link it back to that, then yeah, that would, that would have been a gigantic mistake. Well, I mean, pesticides are pesticides. You know, they're, they're you know, they're, you know, uh, the mechanism, well, you know, though, I mean, being, I mean, you know that the mechanism in, in Roundup is, you know, I mean, it, it affects the growth hormone in the plant, and it's something that we don't, as mammals, we don't have that hormone. So in that respect, it's not poisonous to us in the same way that it is to plants. Does that mean that it's completely harmless? I probably wouldn't want to drink Roundup out of a jug, but I mean, as far as other alternatives, it's much less <laughs> toxic to us than some of the alternatives yep. are. You know, uh, is, it, is it overused? Maybe, I don't know. There, there's a lot of evidence that shows that, uh, um, that it's pretty safe, you know. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to show, there's a lot more evidence showing that it's safe than there is to show that it's not. Well, we've gone over our time. But, oh, one, yes, please. I, I'm just curious. The first question you ask all of us was, what do you think of when you think of an American farmer? I'd be curious how you two would answer that question. Um, I, you know, I think we kind of hit it at, at, at points throughout our discussion here. But, um, you know, I, I think one of the first things I said was just opportunity, um, that everybody has the opportunity to, to be a producer. Um, certainly comes easier to some who, uh, you know, have had the, the fortune to be kind of born into that or, or grandfathered into that, but um, everybody has that, that opportunity to some degree. And I think that's, that's kind of what it, it hits at. I would say that they are, farmers, not just in America, but everywhere, are the world's greatest optimists. <laughs> you know, that you, you put, uh, 
one seed in the, in the ground with the intent that it's going to multiply itself in just a few months into many fold uh, times its, its initial state. And or that you're with a lot of external factors. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things that can go wrong. Or, or you know, the, the miracle of, of, of breeding livestock and, and what those, you know, you're going to have, have two where there used to be, or you're going to have three where there used to be two. Or, or in the case of things like pigs that have multiple litters, you know, multiple babies per, per litter. Is, you know, it's a, I think the optimist and business people and generally people of faith, you know, that you have to leave so much up to um, chance. And I, I, I don't say it's chance, I say it's, it's a, you have to leave things up to, to a higher power to you know, that you're going to make things work out. And, um, you know, fortunately we live, because I've lived in, in South Dakota too, and we're living in a place here where the likelihood of the dice coming up with the right numbers are a lot higher than they are in other places. And so I'm thankful for that too, that I don't have, you know, I, I know I lived up by, uh, by the river in, you know, Central South Dakota. It's, we complain about the environment here, but there's a lot harsher environments to, to try and get things to grow than we have here. So um, I guess the, I'm wandering on the answer to your question. But that's my uh, my roundabout answer. Is that, you know I think it's a it's a calling, and, and uh, those that are are committed to it and doing it right are, uh, you know, people that deserve respect. So um, if you have a chance to fill out your survey, that helps us to pro um, provide response to our grant from the American Library Association, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Citizen Film, which produced um, American Creed, and we also want to thank um, Pioneer Public Television because they are helping us um, promote this event too. And it sounds like we need to have another conversation because there's still a lot, lot to talk about. Um, very important topic. So I really want to thank Ian and Tim for being here uh, for us tonight. So thank you very much. Have a cookie.